that stand for them. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Clay Davis, I'm the Senior Awards Editor at Variety. Thanks for coming by today. I brought some friends with me and we're gonna have a chat. Sounds good? Yeah. How'd you love Maestro? <laughs> All right, let's have a talk, you guys. Let's start with, uh, that was really nice, thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Bradley Cooper. Director, producer, writer, star, Bradley Cooper. Uh, amazing, uh, listen, I love Star is Born, and then you do this, and I'm like, all right, so you're just gonna be a great director now, and just keep getting better every time. But this obviously was a passion project for you. Can you talk about the initial inception, the thought of bringing Leonard Bernstein to life for us to experience? It started with, thanks for saying that. Um, that's a lot of pressure. Um, uh, it started with just a desire and a love of um, of this kind of music and conducting since a kid, and then and then that segued. What's that? Oh, that hurts. And that segued into um, Steven Spielberg was going to do a movie about Leonard Bernstein, and then I um, I read a, a, a script that Josh Singer had written. Uh, and then, but I was just in post on The Star is Born and I said to Stephen, are you really gonna direct it? Because if not, maybe I could uh, research it and maybe write something and I'd be happy if, if Josh joined me and if there's a movie that I could think that I would wanna make or there's a reason to make. And then he said yes, so then I just started researching it and then unearthed this amazing relationship and then, then this incredible, talented, wonderful person. <laughs> And then we were blessed with Maya Hawk to play our daughter. <laughs> and of course, my sister over there, Sarah Silverman. <laughs> and, uh, and then Lenny's best friend, uh, Aaron Copeland, who was my best friend, Brian Buckman. <laughs> so it really was just, you know, a series of events of meeting a wonderful artists and them joining on this journey and then it just becoming more and more uh, powerful and uh, and magical. Very well said, thank you. Uh, Carrie Mulligan, the very, uh, very talented Carrie Mulligan. Uh, Belisi has brought to life heart and soul of Lenny's life and the film as well. Can you talk about stepping into her shoes to teach us about a very complex man that we thought we knew but we had no idea. Yeah, I mean, it, I think I had the advantage of not knowing really anything about Leonard Bernstein. Um, and so getting to learn about their lives together and their marriage was was just like opening a new brilliant book. You know, it was just, there was so much to learn about them and what brought them together and what I think kept them, kept them together. Um, and it was just the most, they were just the most extraordinary people. And the more you learned about them, the more you wanted to be in the room with them. It felt like you would listen to recordings of them. We had these amazing recordings of them. And being at the dinner table just sounded like the best dinner table in the world. And you saw, I want to be friends with them, but then we get to be them. You know, it was very weird. And then, um, but the whole, you know, it, it started with, with just, you know, being asked to, to make a story about marriage by Bradley, like getting to work with him as an actor, having always wanted to work with him. And I always thought we'd work together in theatre first because we were, that's how we kind of knew each other a little bit more. Um, but to get to act with him was like a big, big, big goal. And then having seen The Star Is Born, it was then right, I want to be directed by him as well. And then he wrote this unbelievable character. Um, my hawk. Oh, you can, you can stand there. <laughs> my hawk. Obviously, Bradley and Carrie have the pressure of playing these two amazing people, but then you had some added pressure because uh, kids are still here, and you're playing kids that are obviously involved in the movie. Can you talk about getting in that underlying um, understanding of the relationship between a father and his children, and what did you learn uh, about him through your conversations? Well, I had a wonderful advantage, which was that Jamie had written the book, um, Famous Father Girl, which is a really, really wonderful book, which I think 
was a big aspect of research for the script as well and the, and the story and family. But so there was, was so much space to dive into her mind and a kind of overwhelming amount of information about what her take was on on her life experience and on everything. And I never, I haven't met her. Um, and I didn't really um, interview her like for this part, which I would love to say was a strategic decision, but it wasn't. Um, it, it was more like a, something that didn't feel like a necessity to, necessity to me, especially because many members of the cast could not beat their, um, the person they were playing, and so it, it felt like being more one with everyone to, to not, but rather to use the evidence that she'd so lovingly left of her life and of her experience um, for, of research that was available, and so that was so fun, but really, as much research as one does, I, I think that when it comes to acting and, and playing parts, it's way more about what's happening in the room than whatever has happened before. You know, all the departments work together to set up the period, period to be appropriate, the script to be true to the lives to which you're working on, all that work happened beforehand and wasn't my work. Um, my work was, talking to those people about it, what did I think, what did I think she would wear, what I think she would do, but, and then, and then it's just being present, and being present with actors like the people that are on this stage in the moments that I got to be is a luxury, and I, I don't really know that it's possible to be inauthentic when you're surrounded by such authenticity. Yeah. Um, so it, I don't even think I would have had to do any research, just would have had to look into their eyes and, and feel the work that they had done. And reverberate through me. I, I also did research, but I, I did what didn't need to. Um. Yeah. Everyone needs a Maya Hawk in their life. And that's what we like. that's what we uh, Sarah Silverman, Madame. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations on your Golden Globe nomination today for stand up comedy. Not for this, because that would be weird. It was for something else, but you're still so talented. Um, can you talk about the first time you read the script and read Shirley and what, how your reaction to her was and her relationship to Lenny? Well, I was really excited and I, I, well, first I only just, I had pages. I auditioned and I had pages and it was like nine pages of, of mostly Shirley dialogue because it was in, from, worked off of an interview with Gruen who wrote the book on him and, and, and we had the audio of it, but at the time I didn't have the audio of it. I didn't know how she talked, but she she was familiar to me. And here's a big um, exclusive that I don't think I ever told Bradley, but it was so many words and I had to learn it and put myself on tape that a friend of mine who's in sound gave me an earwig and I said all the lines into my phone and then I played it back and so when I was saying the words I was listening for my next line and it worked very well for me because I, I was forced to not be in my head. And I could hear him giving you the lines. <laughs> I cast both of you. <laughs> oh, no, I never heard it. But, um, and, and I got to meet the, the family, I got to meet Jamie and Alexander and Nina on a Zoom, and they immediately felt like Mishbuka, and I knew them, like I totally knew them, you know, and oh, I heard of, I don't, I don't know if this is okay, but hey, whatever, we're all friends, cone of silence. Um, they told me the greatest thing about Shirley, uh, this is a crazy fun fact, but I feel that there's enough time has passed that, uh, it won't have to be a, a big, uh, we're cool, right? <laughs> she was, uh, she was a producer on the quiz show that Quiz Show is based on. No! And she, yes, I didn't tell you that. And she like, her job was to like, give the guy the answers. And then Lenny kept her name out of the scandal. Oh. I, don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I actually don't even know who this is. <laughs> but they called her our girl Cheryl, and they they always kind of they kind of laughed as they talked about her, which is beautiful. And she was funny, and she that was her currency. But I think there was a sadness underneath it all that she so wanted to be taken as seriously as her brother, which that was not to be. They were very close. I don't remember the answer, but I'm sure that was. <laughs> 
I will say is the wonderful thing. Yeah, the wonderful thing about um, Sarah was, was again, the movie's about the two people really, about, about Lenny and Felicia, and every other character is in service of their story, and and the Jamie character really is a is a, is a representative of all of the siblings. That was what it seemed when we were writing the script was the best way to focus on one child and actually have them their impact of their of this barter of this transaction of this love the impact how it falls on her is a reflection of how it falls on all three of them and and she had so much so little real estate to convey all that as does the friendship between lenny and aaron as does the relationship between lenny and his sister and so to have these actors that were able to deliver in such specific ways with such a short amount of time was just a gold for, for a filmmaker. So I just want to thank them in front of you. <laughs> Truly. Brian, uh, Bradley gave me a great segue. Uh, in the film, uh, you play Lenny's best friend, Aaron. And uh, as Bradley shared at the beginning, he says you're his best friend, even though he told me I was his best friend yesterday, but that's fine. Um, can you talk about uh, what it was like to work with Bradley and be directed by him and see you know, him really just transform into a master in front of us? Um, it, was pretty, it was pretty special. The, the conducting thing, as he said, uh, since he was a little kid, he was always conducting. So that was just kind of fun to watch him move into that space. But I felt so safe and challenged at the same time, which is a tough dichotomy to have, feel safe and challenged. And uh, he really created that space. But it's funny, right from the beginning, he said, bro, it's just us. Sit there, you know, we're best friends. We gotta bring that to it. And he really encouraged, like, to just bring that truth. I think that's, <clears throat> I think underneath it all, like, it was just that struggle for truth. I, I think everybody up here who worked on the movie can, Bradley, like, if it's not truth, it's out. Like, he just wants you to get into that place of, of reality. And, uh, you know, it could be tough working with your friends and can be, can be also challenging and scary and all of that stuff, but it was, uh, it was so great to have all that history be encouraged to come onto the, onto the set and into our interactions. Uh, Carrie, I, Carrie, I have to ask you about the scene where, and listen, I've been a big Carrie fan for a long time in education, Bronx Young Woman, Inside the Wind Davis, the list goes on and on. But I really believe your gift to cinema is, I can say it with one word, Snoopy. It is such a fiery scene. Can you talk about getting into that moment and the preparation it took to execute it? Yeah, I mean, that was such an unbelievable gift as an actor to have that scene. Um, and that was, we, I mean, you know, that was one of the first things that I read in this, in this script that um, Josh and Bradley worked on together was this scene. So we've been in my head for like four years, you know, we'd read it to each other hundreds of times. And every time I was in, so Bradley asked me to do this in 2018. So we had started work really then and so every time I was in New York or LA I'd go over to his house we'd sit we'd read it and that scene was there from the I mean that I distinctly remember the on the waterfront opening of the film with the phone call and thing and coming down to kind of all very mapped out from our first meeting I mean from the literally the first time we met um in 2018 and then also that scene became not long after that and I just remember reading it thinking oh shit that's the one <laughs> like that's the like that's the scene that's the audition scene that's the scene that i'm definitely gonna fuck up on the day like it's gonna be the one that i'm gonna worry about and i'm gonna think about it all the time that i'm gonna get that i'm gonna completely tank it and so it was but it was just i mean it was just too good to be true as a piece of writing for a woman you know it's just extraordinary um so yeah it was just in our heads a lot it's a way it's one of the ways in which we practiced our dialect with tim monick our incredible dialect coach was doing that scene. So I think by the time we got to shoot, it was the last thing we shot in that segment of shooting right in New York. Um, so, and we went into this incredible set that Kevin Thompson recreated the Dakota apartment. And and so it was like, you felt like you were in, it was a bizarre, you felt like you were in the room and Bradley set up that wide shot and we did 
three takes of the thing from start to finish. That was the third take. And then we all went home at like two. It was great. <laughs> and to one up Bradley here, uh, your big moment, and listen, nine Oscar nominations later, you're one of the best that I've, I've seen working today, but then you <laughs> have a concert scene that is scary good because yeah, I was like, oh, Leonard Bernstein's alive and he's just here hanging out. And you got him before you went to shoot this movie because you really do transform. Do you talk about getting into that? Because I heard it was just one take as well. Uh, can you talk about getting into that mode? Thanks for saying that. Um, and that is actually how it, how it felt, uh, oddly enough. From the most of the movie, it felt like he was there and I just got out of the way. Um, is how it really did feel. Um, he's such a powerful guy. I really do believe that's why, if that movie has affected you at all, it's because the power of the, of these these people. The, the time has bent for us. I think certainly for me making this film, I don't understand how I didn't meet him. I don't understand that I don't know him. You know, I don't. I can't get my head around that. Um, and that 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 conducting scene was something that I found in research. Uh, it's on YouTube, you can see it. If you Google, you know, if you YouTube Bernstein Mahler to Ely Cathedral, it'll come up. And it's the end of the resurrection, the Mahler Second Symphony. And it was the most incredible piece of music I'd ever heard. And I couldn't believe that it was never in a film. And I don't think it's ever been used in a movie, which I don't understand. Maybe Mahler and Lenny were waiting for this. I don't know, it's crazy, because it's just the most incredible, I would just floor it and I would play it for everybody I knew. I would say, have you seen this? Like all of, all the time. And, and I said, well this has to, we have to do that, this, this has to be, this has to represent something in the movie, I don't know what. And then finally, because everything has to be done to story, it was like, oh, it's the moment where we realize why she was with him and that there is no hate in his heart. It's the, it's the, it's the reaction of the fight scene, the Snoopy scene. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost kind of the moment where they both kind of fall in love with each other in a more true way, I think. I didn't know that when we were shooting it, uh, but I watching it, I feel that way. That's the beautiful thing about art too, it sort of tells you what it is after you've, you've made it. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, sorry. Uh, it, so that scene was, um, I just spent many years learning how to conduct for those six and a half minutes. And uh, with Gustavo Dudamel, I worked with him when he conducted the LA Phil at the Hollywood Bowl, that piece from the first rehearsal to the last performance. I went with him to Berlin, uh, with the Berlin Philharmonie where he went and he did the, that piece again. And then Yannick Seglin, just an incredible conductor for the Philadelphia Orchestra and the Met Opera, he worked with me. And then, and then there's that YouTube uh, video uh, where you could watch him conduct. And then so we then went and did it. We went to the place, to Ely Cathedral, where he did it. We asked the London Symphony Orchestra to come and the chorus, and then I took a shot and tried to conduct that piece of music and put it on film, and I messed it up the whole first day. Truly fucked up every take, and it was crazy, horrible. And I was like, "Wow, this is the moment where like your life ends." And it's like you know, you really you're like this is the thing that people talk about. You know, the moment where the person cracked, and uh, and then I woke up the next morning and I thought, "Oh my gosh, like this movie's not. This is uh oh." <laughs> but I told Netflix to trust me. They shouldn't have. <laughs> Um, and then, and then I really like took a breath. And if I've learned anything in this movie, it's about like calmness, and relaxation is the best way for creativity to occur, and not trying to muscle it. And I was shooting it, and it really was interesting, Clayton, because I had set up all these shots to shoot that scene out of fear. Most of the movie is very s simple, not simple, but very specific camera movements and compositions. There's no, there's no coverage that's on the cutting room floor of scenes and that was one scene that I had like three cameras at once in the cable cam and it was all done out of fear that I thought I would actually not be able to conduct it and so then and I didn't with all those cameras I kept messing up behind the beat not not cueing an instrument uh, and then the London Symphony Orchestra playing it going like well, we got it because you certainly don't <laughs> and then I'm feeling that and it was like this is a nightmare this is an absolute nightmare and, uh, and then the next day, I brought in the techno crane, which was sitting outside, actually, because we were going to shoot an exterior shot of Felicia entering. 
and we wheel that thing, this sort of like dinosaur, this mechanical dinosaur through the, the bowels of this cathedral. And I asked everybody to wait and I spent like two and a half hours with my iPhone having recorded the sound from the day before and moved the, the, the crane and set up that shot that you see on a 27 millimeter lens that ends with her, the, over her shoulder because that's what the scene's about. And it was through messing up the whole day before that it led me to the realization of what the story's asking for here. Wow. And so I brought everybody back in, mm. said a prayer uh, openly to Lenny, which actually was, was beautiful because it, uh, it was weird to do that in front of everybody, but I thanked him. Mm -hmm. And then um, I started the, to conduct and it was, it, it was, it worked, I did, it was perfect. And, um, and that's what's in the movie, it's one take. Wow. <laughs> Now, all of you go do that now. All right. Uh, my question for the other actors here, because Bradley is helming this movie, what's a really interesting or fun piece of advice that Bradley gave you on set uh, being directed by him? What uh, amazing thing did he do that he probably won't take credit for because that's the type of guy he is? Anybody? Shall I go? Okay. <laughs> Um, I can't, it, 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 I've never had an experience like it, and, and I think I can say the same for, I mean, to, to, this, to this end, the first time I ever met Brian Klugman, I'd never met Brian Klugman, I only met Aaron Copeland, and he was wearing fake teeth, and his hair was, and he was, and he was rehearsing all of these anecdotes, and we were sitting doing this piece where we were on the floor, Lenny and Felicia are on the floor having a picnic, and Aaron Copeland is sitting on a chair, and, and you see the beautiful crane shot comes in, he's telling all of these stories. And, and so I met him in that context, and Bradley would say, tell us another one, as Lenny, tell us another one. And then he would say, oh, okay, here's the story about Paris. And, then he, and, and Brian had learned all of these incredible anecdotes in detail as Aaron, and had them all at the top of his tongue to just say them all and every and and then we'd hear that story and then Lenny would ask for another story and Aaron and it was until like the following day in the evening when I saw that his teeth were fake <laughs> and I was like thank god because <laughs> the teeth were just shocking I mean you don't, you don't actually see in the movie how bad they were they were just they were bad and but that was the level of incredible commitment that that Brian had put in but that everyone had, had been inspired to do because Bradley had been doing it already for like five years. And so you got there and it was like, you never heard action, you never heard cut, there was no like dramatic start and finish, right? like you walked into a playground. And as an actor, that's like the best thing. I mean, all I ever try and do is forget that there's cameras. And, and that was, that was, that Bradley created a set where the crew were not the crew, they were the company. It was like a company making something, and so there was no distinction between you and other crew. It felt like it was all part of the same thing, and everyone was telling the same story. So all of the artifice was taken away, so it was just easy to do. Like, you didn't have to push for things. It just came, and I think, like, I've never worked with a, with in that kind of environment ever with a director who could, could facilitate that kind of environment for actors. My final question for all of you, and we'll start with Brian and work, your, work our way down. Um, I'm a thorough believer that when you do something like this, there's a kind of piece of you that changes because of the movie, but it stays with you forever. Can you share with everyone what that is? What will you, what will you remember from your time here? Um, there's one thing that really sticks with me, and uh, it comes from watching Bradley go through this process, but also seeing it in action, which is do the work. I mean, like it was hammered into me in this journey more than any I've ever had in, in this business. Um, I was watching actors who had done the work. I watched Bradley be tireless with the work, and I did the work. To your story, like I, I like spent so much time not knowing if the part's gonna be one line, not knowing it's gonna be, a million lines, whatever, I didn't know, but I was like, I'm gonna learn everything I can about this person. I'm gonna tirelessly work on this voice and I'm gonna learn these anecdotes. And you know what, when that moment happened, that Bradley said, why don't you tell some of those stories? It was 
it was the best moment I've ever had on a set and I've been doing this a long time. It was so mm -hmm. free. So the thing I will take from this is, even though like it's something you say, do the work, it's something I feel on, on a deeper level than I ever, I ever did before. does odd jobs I would you know a lot of times if a movie came my way I would look and go well how many group scenes are there because that's a lot of sitting around or how many like just just technical things that I go oh, I don't want to but he this is this isn't gonna be beautiful it's just true and but he he expected a lot from us I feel like I still could have done more but he he did so much homework and so and was so knew exactly what he wanted and knew and and before we even got to set he would have everything figured out that like we really had room to it, he made me love he made me love acting you know he made me really love acting and want to do it more because it it was so fun and even though this is at like a high level with a big budget and all this stuff it this and it that you didn't feel the stakes once we were shooting because you were just in it and like you said like you said you know it was like I was Shirley uh, this was Jamie this was Aaron like and we were just in it so we she shot a big we sh we shot a big party scene, and and you know I, I, I you know I, I saw the movie like a year ago and then I hadn't seen it, and then recently I watched it, and it's totally different, but it's still, it. after the first time, I was like, no, it's done, it's done, you know? <laughs> like, what do I know? But we ended up shooting more, you know, finishing what we were gonna shoot and all this other stuff, and then it, it's so, at its soul is the same, but so different from the first time I saw it, and it's just like, wow! And my point was what? It was like, no, it really was going to culminate in my mind. She's so honest. No. <laughs> anyway, that was good. That was good. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> scene and I, I can't believe this was in the movie like there's a moment where he just like walks over to me and it's like yeah I don't know what's going on with Felicia whatever I mean he didn't say it. he said it like yeah I don't, I don't know it's got you know the way he talks but oh god I'm making this worse but he just improvised you know he was just he just improvised and it wasn't anything we planned and I didn't know that that was a possibility but it wasn't daunting because I was Shirley and I just said what Shirley would say and then he said I'm gonna go take a big dump and I was like wonderful you know? <laughs> it was in the movie I'm telling you Bradley she has a thing in her ear that they were saying that to her the whole time that's what it was Maya <laughs> In all honesty, since you asked your last question, I've been trying to thread the needle on this anecdote in my head, and I don't think I've done it yet still, but I'm gonna try. Because I just can't remember the exact context, but there was this moment where th there's a dog in the movie, um, our family dog, and, <laughs> and the dog was not a professional dog. It was an amateur dog. And uh, I promise this is gonna get to what you taught me and what I took in with my experience, but, um, but it was, a, it was an amateur dog, and I was in the movie, and there was these, these moments where Bradley kept wanting me to run, I can't, this is why it's not a good anecdote, because I can't remember the exact context, but kept wanting me to run into this room and go get the dog and bring the dog out. And then he would send the dog back into the room for the scene again. And then I'd go in and get the dog and bring the dog out again. And I was having a mental internal crisis, where I was like, this is not a professional dog. I am traumatizing this dog by going to like get like it's so confused it keeps getting in the room and I was like gonna cry I was like where's the dog handler I'm, why am I getting the dog I should be my job um, and then something clicked and I actually swear to God this was like my turning point in understanding like how to take my research 
and be in the, the movie that I was in. Like, it was the moment where I was like, oh, I understand what movie I'm in. I'm in this movie, this moment. Because I wasn't a professional dog either. Um, and like, and, and none of us were professional dogs in this situation, even though I'm sitting in a room full of some of the highest professionals in their field and speaking, which is embarrassing. Um, but, um, but I was like, oh, I, I, like I am with this dog in my beginner's mind right now on this set. And like, I need to figure out how to keep this dog calm, even though it's doing this repeated exercise and doesn't totally understand what's going on. Just like I need to figure out how to keep myself calm. And like, like Jamie's trying to be calm in the situation where her mother is sick and like where everything is out of control. And I was like, oh, he wants it to be real. Like, that's why we have amateur dogs on this set, myself. <laughs> it's because he wants it to be real. And it all, something clicked in my relationship to acting. I have to, to defend acting. the dog. I, I think she, he, would be, he would be a little, he wasn't an amateur. <laughs> He was a real dog. I mean, he, he wasn't, his profession was not acting. But he, was, he was on the set all the time. His name was Sweet Jean. He's an amazing dog. He's an amazing dog. He just wasn't like a pro. Well, he's a pro at what he does as a dog. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I just got to defend him. I'm sorry. No. Bradley won't stand for dogs being disrespected on this stage. But my, I got my, my you're so right. Yeah, and I remember that very well. And it, it it, again, it's about like being calm and, and, and you know, it was, a, it was a horrible, that week of shooting when Felicia's dying, we were in that house. And, um, and again, we had such an incredible crew because everybody, it was just, we went to work and everybody was quiet because we knew that Felicia was dying. And it really, honestly, it was like that. Uh, and we were still laughing and, you know, I mean, the biggest laugh of the whole movie is when the doctor was trying to wheel up to tell her her diagnosis and it was so squeaky and he just couldn't do it. And I was just like, and, and he's actually was my doctor, Bernard Kruger. And I was like, Bernard, just roll up, just roll up. He's like, I'm Bradley, I can't, I can't do it. Like, you got to tell her, dude, it's one ten. I don't want to cut. <laughs> so funny stuff did happen. But th that was an example of um, the, the main, the, 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 um, the, what I remember with my dad was everything it was just so surreal and the smallest things drove us cra drove me crazy and when uh, when he was dying and that yeah there was something about the dog and like because I wanted you to have the dog so the dog could come in and also you didn't want the dog because Mendy the, the guests were coming remember so you wanted to grab the dog so the dog doesn't run out of the house that was the sort of thing which would really happen you know at least with, with our dogs and and just that little action that direction you all of a sudden, to me at least, as watching it, you were just like, the whole reality came. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, no, really, it was amazing. And it really was because of Sweet Jean. <laughs> but I'm saying, but that was really kind of a beautiful, yeah, I'm glad you brought it. Because the realism you brought into the moment and the way- Sweet Jean did it, yeah. You allowed, well, but you, you hired Sweet Jean. I did, that's right. <laughs> Uh, That's directing. <laughs> ending on a dog is the best part you can do. Uh, I, I, sorry, guys. They have to leave, so I need you to s stay near your seats. You can stand up one more time and give a round of applause to the cast. And then let them walk out. But thank you for coming. It's on going to watch.